Designing, manufacturing, installing, and maintaining the high-speed electronic computer, the largest and most complex computers ever built. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Building Better Systems podcast, where we explore tools and approaches that make us more effective engineers and make our software safe and reliable. My name is Joey Dodds. And I'm Spat Morina. And today we're joined by Aditya Takor. And I have me briefly met with Aditya. We were uh, introduced by a, a mutual colleague, and we've heard great things, uh, exciting research. And my favorite thing that I've learned so far is uh, that he cares very deeply for his grad students and wants <laughs> to feature them. And, and that made me like him straight off the bat. So I'm sure we're going to get along great. Uh, is there anything you'd like to share about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm Aditya Thakur. I'm uh, currently an assistant professor uh, in the computer science department at the University of California, Davis. So I joined about uh, three years ago, uh, before which I was at Google, uh, and I got my PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. That's excellent. And so we'll start with our first question, which is, what is your approach to building better systems? Right. So my, my research interests are in uh, program analysis and verification. So I believe that uh, we need tools and techniques to help software developers write better code, write secure code, safer code. Uh, software is getting more prevalent. It's getting more complex. Uh, so I think anything we can do to make the job of software developers better uh, uh, would have a huge impact. So the specific research interests in, in program analysis and verification are, uh, are abstract interpretation. That's a, a technique for static program analysis. Uh, apart from that, we are also developing bug finding tools. And more recently, we are looking at uh, approaches for, for dealing with deep neural networks since you know, they are pretty hot and they might uh, you know, lead to different ways of writing software. So, uh, yeah. So we heard maybe a lot of phrases that people mm -hmm. haven't heard before. I heard abstract interpretation as well as bug finding, which to maybe someone that's not as familiar with formal methods, everything in formal methods might sound like bug, bug finding. Could you highlight a bit of what both of those are about? Right. So, uh, so abstract interpretation is just a very general framework in which you can write a lot of static analysis tools. Uh, so the purpose of the static analysis can be very different. So if you are a compiler writer, uh, you would want to analyze your program and find invariants. So properties at particular program points that are always true. So if a compiler, uh, if a static analysis used in a compiler says that a variable x is 5, it, it better always be 5, because you might use this to do some optimizations, you know, constant folding, and so on. Uh, but another use for static analysis is to find bugs. And in some sense, when you're writing a bug finder, what you care about is, does it find bugs, right? So you, you care about things like uh, false positive rates, false negative rates, and so on. So the, even though the underlying approach can be similar, since the overarching metrics are different, the approaches uh, tend to be slightly different and have, have a slightly different focus. And how do you think about when to use which of these two approaches or when you use the sort of fully formal approach versus the bug finding approach? Right. I think in, in some ways they're complementary. Uh, so a lot of the research we do, uh, we like to have a mix of let's try and create a new formalism. Let's try and uh, come up with a theorem, right? Let's try and come up with a framework that is agnostic to the specific application. Uh, when you're thinking about bug finding, you're, you're focusing on a particular class of bugs. And uh, there uh, you are more worried about, you know, what's the, what's the particular application? What's, are there any, uh, you're also tuned into specific uh, uh, patterns that developers use, right? Um, and of course you might use some static analysis techniques, but in the end, if you have a specific class of bugs, then you are focused on that. Uh, so for instance, one of the class of bugs where we've been looking at 
is this problem of error handling in systems code. So in C code, like the Linux kernel OpenSSL, uh, you don't have exception handling. Instead, when functions have to indicate that there's an error, they'll return a specific value. So for instance, malloc will return null when, when there's an error. Uh, but in most other cases, there'll be an integer value, like say minus one or minus two, uh, which, which tells the caller of the function that there's an error. Now, all of these nomenclatures are sparsely documented or they're in the minds of the developers. And the type of bugs that can occur because of this type of error handling is that you might call a function, but you might not check for the error after the call. So you might not have something like if the return is zero, you know, handle the error. And this can get tricky because these errors are propagated along long call chains. And even finding out what the error handling specification is for a function can be tricky. So here we're sort of trying to get a sense of what is this specification, computing it uh, automatically, and then writing a bug checker. So in this work, we didn't we don't have a theorem which says that the the specification is sound, right? We're not saying that uh, the set of error values that can be returned in a function, right? Whatever this set is, that we are over approximating it, right? So we're just saying. I think this is reasonable, and then we're finding bugs, and those bugs are true bugs, and that we, when we report them to the developer, they find it useful, right? If you are more in the formal sense, then you want to have some guarantee saying whatever uh, invariant you're finding is a true invariant, whatever uh, properties you're finding, they're sort of over approximating the, the underlying program and so on. And that's, so you really get a lot more freedom in one of these approaches around yes. making sure there, there are different kinds of freedom, I guess, and bug yes. finding, you kind of don't have to worry that much about catching every single problem, right? but you do have to worry a lot often about reporting things that maybe didn't turn out to be a problem at the end. Of the day. Exactly. Exactly. So there's a, there's a, you have to be more cognizant of false positives and so on that you, your developers have a finite amount of time. Uh, and when you were, whenever you report something, you might want to make sure that it's a true bug. So you'd also have techniques that are ranking bug reports uh, generated by these static analysis tools. So you might actually generate hundreds of bug reports, but you might want to rank them and then developers only look at the top 10 and so on. And that's a whole research field in its own, how you yes. actually present those results in a way that gets people to respond and gets people to understand what the tool is saying. Absolutely. And I think there's been a, a big push even in the industry right now where people are focusing on how to integrate these tools with developer workflow. So uh, integrating them with IDEs, integrating them with review tools. So whenever you send out your code for review, there's there'll be some automated tool that will present the results to you and the reviewer. And uh, I, I know that you know Google and Facebook and so on are also looking at how do you fix uh, these bug reports, because that's another another advantage you have. If you're focusing on a particular class of bug, there might also be common fixes uh, that you could try and automate. So I think there's a, there's a, a large spectrum of, of problems and approaches that you could apply. Uh, having said that, I think the where you're trying to get those guarantees, that has its unique challenges, and and there are equally and an equal number of use cases for that. Right? When, you're, when you're trying to ship code, when you're trying to write your compiler optimizer, it has to be correct. Uh, you can't sort of hand wave like, oh, it, it, most, it works most of the time. That's good enough. You can't really, that doesn't fly there. And I think kind of the formal methods dream these days are one that we think about and discuss quite often is the idea of moving smoothly from bug finding into verification. Uh, bug finding, it's immediately obvious how it's useful to you if you're a developer mm -hmm. because you are you find a bug in a minute or two that it maybe would have taken you a few days to, to shake out, or maybe you never would have shaken it out. Uh, but once you do that enough, you say, well, if the tools can tell me when there's some bugs, how can the tools tell me that there's never going to be a bug again or that there's no bugs at all in the code? It's sort of a natural extension from right. one to the next. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and I, and I think there... Uh... Uh, the place where both the tools intersect in some ways is 
if, if you have a verification tool and all it returns is, yes, there's a bug, no, there isn't a bug, that's not really useful for a developer, right? So uh, the same way, a bug finding tool usually just doesn't just say there's a bug, it'll give you an input that causes the bug or an abstract trace through the program or a line number which says, hey, here's the null dereference and so on. So I think a lot of verification tools and techniques also support giving a witness uh, or a, a, either a witness that there's a, there's a problem or some notion of here's why I think the program is correct. And I think that's also an important and active area of, of research. I'm curious at the outset, what made you go into this research and going after these things? It sounds like you were working in industry and then something was appealing about leaving that behind, going into academia and, and doing research on these topics. Just curious how, how that came to be. Uh -huh. So I guess that, that I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. One is why this uh, subfield of computer science, and then I'll, I'll, ask, I'll answer your second question, which is why move back to academia. Uh, so I think my, my love or passion for, for you know, formal methods or program analysis started way back in, in an undergraduate compiler class. Right? So that's probably the first course where you are uh, thinking about a program that is manipulating other programs. And that was quite nice. You, you were exposed to this in a theory of computation class, but compilers are sort of a practical manifestation of that, that, uh, that idea. And, and also uh, compilers and program analysis and formal methods, it gives you a nice spectrum where you can have a lot of theory you can, you can come up with new formalism, come up with a theorem, a proof, uh, some complexity theory result. And then the next day you can get up and say, okay, let me write uh, some uh, really efficient C++ or Camel, whatever code, uh, which actually you know, implements these ideas. So there's, um, there's this nice spectrum from theory to formalism that you can shift between when you're in this field. And I think that was really appealing. And in terms of your second question was, you know, why I should come back to academia? So um, I, I think that the, the way to answer that question is why did I move to Google in the first place? So I, I think the reason for that was to apply some of the ideas, you know, in my PhD and in my earlier research uh, in an industrial setting. So we were sort of trying to work with uh, security engineers and develop tools uh, program analysis tools to help them, and 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 that was really interesting. And I also spent some time in a sort of more traditional software engineering job, and I got exposed to, you know, shipping code and dealing with quality assurance engineers and uh, deploying and modifying code and and looking at logs and debugging them. And, and I would say that was even more enlightening in terms of uh, from a sort of true software engineer's point of view of how they, what they have to deal with and, and how their view is. Uh, and I think it was more like uh, you're working there and then ideas start building up saying that, oh, I wish I could spend six months building this tool that I'm, I'm, I feel I need now. Uh, but of course, when you're dealing with uh, quarterly uh, expectations and OKRs and you, know, you have to ship something, it, you don't really have time. Um, so I think those ideas uh, started building up and I was like, okay, maybe uh, I should try and go back to academia and, and try and solve some of these uh, fund foundational problems, uh, but still not forget uh, what I learned in, in industry and, and make sure that you know, if, if at all possible, try and come up with some new theory, but also make sure that you, you can, like a software engineer might want to use that. Use that. Right. Uh, so there were there were some problems which I saw while I was a software engineer, and you know perhaps we solved them in uh, we had an engineering solution back there, right? Uh, which might involve something like let's just throw more memory and more CPUs and throw it to the cloud, and then uh, some of the work that I've been doing at UC Davis recently on abstract interpretation has been on scaling up. Uh, these foundational tools, and that has led to new algorithms, new formalisms, and and I think pretty impressive experimental results as well. So it's it's sort of uh, in some ways industry gives you a lot of freedom to solve a lot of problems, and you get exposed to that. 
uh, but I felt I I could have uh, and, and a sort of nice impact when I was in academia uh, and take that experience with me. If, if does that sort of make sense? Yeah. So I, I want to get back to the impressive experimental results uh, the, later because that sounds interesting. Um, but I just wanted to to say so it, it sounds like you're you, you essentially took with you these concerns and the problems that that maybe developers conventional engineers that don't you know aren't started in academia and aren't exposed to formal methods mm -hmm. taking those concerns and apply essentially looking through that lens exactly through yes. research and work yes and is that is that common um i think there there are a lot of researchers who do interact with industry uh you know they have sabbaticals at industry and so on um and uh, so I, I can't i don't know whether it's common but i think there are people out there who do want to make formal methods uh usable uh and and i think it's um uh, there's there's also a big push in academia to make research reproducible uh there there are tools papers so they're encouraging not just new th uh, research results, but also you can publish a tools paper which talks about uh, usability and scalability and applications to a particular use case. So I think uh, the formal methods community is aware of, uh, of that there needs to be a bridge between industry and academia. Uh, in, I, I don't know off the top of my he head whether 50% you know, of researchers think about problems this way, uh, but I, I know that people value this in, in general. Have you found the experiences you gained at Google to be valuable? Like if I were a researcher and I was sort of wanted to speculate maybe about what things are like when you're doing software engineering at a big company, but I only had secondhand accounts, would it, would it be helpful to take a sabbatical over the summer and try to work somewhere like that? Or was is it just as good to hear about it? I think... It's definitely useful to experience that. I actually don't know how it would be if you were just doing a sabbatical, because you. I feel you need to go through the whole cycle of of designing something, uh, you know, getting all the approvals from everyone, uh, uh, developing it, getting your code reviewed, uh, talking with other groups, uh, so that because you might need a review you're touching on someone's code somewhere else and uh, you need to get their permission and then you sort of dog food it uh, and and that whole cycle and then three months down the line everything is fine and then you get a weird bug report uh, and then you have to go and uh, debug that or someone changes some other library which means you have to go and update your code right uh, so it's it's I think you it'll be difficult to get that experience if you're just in a three or six month sabbatical and perhaps you're in your sort of research silo where you're not sort of exposed to this whole life cycle. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't think everyone needs to do this. You can, you know, there's there's a lot of interdisciplinary research where physicists work with computer scientists and it's not that the computer scientist has to go and redo their uh, like do a physics degree you can you can talk to people and and so on but uh, i think it definitely helps uh, and it has helped me and uh, and i fear that perhaps even my knowledge of industry is outdated now it's been 3 years since i uh, left so things might have changed drastically uh, and in that case i guess you you hope that you your your students go there and you can interact with them and get some some sort of feedback uh, from them. I can definitely say that I've imported some of the software engineering practice. Uh, so having better code reviews, having sort of a research mono repository, um, having style guides, making sure that builds are reproducible, and making sure continuous integration is set up and, and so on. Uh, and, and that's sort of a, a first order concern of research as opposed to something you do after the fact. Uh, and I think that that emphasis is probably because of you know industrial some industrial experience.
That also sounds like immense value for your students. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. To get that experience with you. Yes, yes. So I, that's true. So, you know, I work with a lot of undergraduates and, uh, and even early graduate students who are not, who haven't written test cases consistently, right? Or they haven't reviewed anyone else's code. Uh, so even teaching them things like, you know, don't be a jerk. Uh, be nice when you are asking for a re review, when you're giving a review, uh, uh, what to look for and how to read code. Right, so people are used to writing a lot of code and reading their own code, but being able to read someone else's code, modify it, uh, is is uh, especially valuable. And also, it it builds. You know, we we share a physical lab space, but uh, in my first year, everyone would have their own GitHub repository, and no one really knew what anyone else was doing. Uh, we would you know we would have group meetings and there would be presentations, but you don't really know because you don't. There's there's no uh, formal framework to to go and look at each other's code and and play around with it, but now that there is a, a common GitHub repo, it's sort of like a virtual lab that people are are working on. Uh, people help each other um, re uh, review their code, revise their code. Uh, there's sort of this default communication that happens because of that. Can I join your research group? <laughs> yes, please. Yes. <laughs> That sounds wonderful. Uh, it sounds like uh, the the best of both worlds, in in some sense, to get to learn research, but to be to see those industrial practices filter down. Uh, it can be when we do when we do hiring in formal methods. It can be hard to find people that have a lot of both of those, and a lot of times we find people that are that are much heavier than you know on one end of that spectrum than the other. Uh, right. And and of course, like all all range of people are valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and have different things to contribute, but being aware of both of these worlds definitely is a is a huge help. So we've seen some really big results in the past, some specific papers that have made huge claims about the size of code that they've been able to verify using abstract interpretation techniques. But you mentioned that one of your goals is to make abstract interpretation more scalable. Can you explain maybe what's going on there, what we've seen in the past uh, versus how you're pushing things forward? Sure. So uh, I, I think definitely abstract interpretation has been one of the more scalable approaches to, to static program analysis. Uh, and, and one of the benefits of abstract interpretation is that you can control you know, the abstraction. Right? So uh, it's a fairly, uh, you, you, can, you can have something like intervals and then you can uh, slowly use more complex uh, analyses. Uh, and uh, there have been a, quite a few industrial tools that do abstract interpretation. So one being, you know, the, the tool by Ast uh, by the Kuzos by uh, called Astray that's been uh, used, you know, to verify um, Airbus code and so on. And there have been a couple of other um, techniques uh, that use abstract interpretation. So I think uh, one thing is uh, a these tools are focused on specific types of programs. So they are focused on C code, uh, which are structured and uh, the specific fixed point algorithm they use uh, relies on the structured C code, right? So what they're doing is they're, uh, they're getting their, uh, they're doing their fixed point by walking over the AST in a specific manner. And those same techniques you cannot use for general uh, code which have go tos and un and unstructured control flow graphs. Uh, so that's actually one of our more recent focus has been on these more general fixed point algorithms for for sort of arbitrary code. Uh, having said that, uh, there's been a lot of very impressive work on uh, both the theory and practice of abstract domains. So this is these are data structures that hold on to the the abstract values as you're computing your your fixed point, right? So there've been a lot of impressive data structures and and so on. Uh, so one of one of our recent papers, which was in Popple last year, was focusing on parallelizing abstract interpreters. So you have sixty four cores in your machine. When you when you run your abstract interpreter, it's going to use one core, right? Uh, so that's a lot of wasted uh, CPU sitting there doing nothing. Uh, and 
Again, there were specific approaches for specific types of abstract interpretations, which were paral paralyzable, uh, but there wasn't a general framework for paralyzation. And one of the reasons was that if you paralyze and you're not careful, you'll get an abstract interpreter that is non-deterministic. So what that means is depending on your scheduler, each time you run your compiler, your abstract interpreter, you might get a different answer. Right? And if it's used in a compiler, what that means is you will get a differently optimized code each time. If you're using this in order to do verification or bug finding, you'll get a different report each time. Right? So you run it, uh, it's, it outputs something, you call your manager over saying, hey, hey, I found a bug. And of course, something else will pop out. So what we designed was a, a sort of general abstract interpretation engine, which was parallel, it was deterministic, and we also had some nice theoretical results which said that in some technical sense, we were optimal in our parallelism, that you, you know, the, the sort of scheduling constraints we had were minimal, right? So, uh, so we, we sort of implemented that and we got, you know, like you can get 10x speed up if you have 16 threads. Of course, it depends on the application and so on. Uh, I think there's a lot to be done. Uh, uh, another one of our recent papers that got into uh, SAS, the Static Analysis Symposium, is on memory efficiency. So if you're trying to do interprocedural abstract interpretation, you can take you know, over 100 gigs of memory when you're trying to do something uh, as simple as, do, as using intervals to find buffer overflows. So you just want to make sure that all your array accesses are bounded, you know, that you're not overflowing the array. Uh, and you're just using intervals, nothing too fancy. Uh, if you run it on you know, real world open source benchmarks uh, programs, then you can take you know, 40, 50, 60 gigs, over 100 gigs. Uh, and what we devised was, again, a generic approach where you would cleverly deallocate memory during the fixed point computation uh, and still be sound, still be precise, and so forth. So we got you know, up to I think 25x reduction in memory. Uh, sometimes you know you'd be taking 30 gigs of RAM, and now you you have less than a gig, uh, and that can be the difference between turning on and turning off some of these interprocedural analyses in practice. Uh, so I think there's definitely been a lot of work, and uh, an abstract interpretation is also a sort of catch-all. Uh, a lot of techniques fall under abstract interpretation. It's such a nice, general, beautiful theory. Uh, but having said that, there have also been industrial tools. Uh, they make certain assumptions in order to get some of their scalability results. And they also have done a lot of uh, neat uh, theoretical and engineering tricks with their abstract domains. And our more recent work was focused on this fixed point computation and making that more efficient you know, via parallelization, as well as more memory efficient by being more careful with how your allocating and deallocating memory during fixed point. So why do I, why do I need a fixed point computation? What's the what's that helping me with? Right. So uh, so let's maybe I should step back and and explain uh, poorly but hopefully good enough uh, what abstract interpretation actually does. Uh, so before talking about abstract interpretation, let's look at what concrete interpretation is. Right. So let's say you have a statement in your program, it increments x by 1. So you have x equals x plus 1. So your concrete interpretation, your semantics of your language, say that if you have a concrete state, right, a state which says, for example, x has the value 10 and y has the value 20, then your concrete semantics says after you execute x equal to x plus 1, x will have the value 11 and y will continue having the value 20. Right? That's your concrete semantics. It takes a single concrete state, looks at the concrete semantics of your program, and gives you a single output concrete state, uh, assuming your semantics is deterministic, yada, yada. Uh, now, what is abstract interpretation? So in abstract interpretation, you have an abstract state. An abstract state is a finite representation of a large number of concrete states. For example, an abstract state could mean x is lies within the interval 0 to 10, and y lies in the interval 20 to 30. 
right? So this is representing a large number of, of concrete states, right? And now what you want to do is you want to take a single step, but in your abstract semantics, right? So now your abstract semantics has to know about intervals here. Right. And again, intuitively, what you would want the abstract semantics to say is after you execute x equal to x plus one, the value of x is in the interval 11 to 21. Right. And y is, is still in the interval uh, 20 to 30, whatever I had before. Right. So now, the same way you can concretely execute your program using a single concrete state, right, at uh, the input. Uh, you will abstractly execute your program using an abstract state at the input, right? And, and ideally, what you want your input abstract state to capture is all possible inputs to your program. So usually, you would say something like, if x is your input, x can be anything. So it could be minus infinity to infinity, right? And then what you're trying to do is abstractly execute your program. And it turns out, well, if you concretely try to do this, you will never terminate, right? You will just keep, there'll always be a new concrete state that you'll have to try and so forth. So what abstract interpretation gives you is certain conditions on these abstract states such that you can guarantee termination. And guaranteeing termination in this context means computing a fixed point. So now suppose you have a, a loop in your program. What you'd want is an abstract state such that if you go around the loop again, Right, and you execute the program abstractly, the abstract state you get is contained in the one you already have. So let's say you have a loop which says for i equal to zero, i less than 10, i plus plus, do something, right? And your abstract state at the loop header is i is between you know zero to 10. Then as you go around the loop, you will continue to be uh, between zero and 10. And so what you've done is you've reached a fixed point. You, you, you have some abstract state where when you abstractly execute your program, you get the same abstract state. So it's a fixed point. And a fixed point corresponds to, in this case, a loop invariant, and more generally, a program invariant. Right? It's a state where once you execute, you get the same invariant or a tighter invariant. Uh, so that's can be used as, as uh, an invariant. And again, if, you, if you're assuming that any possible input can occur in the input, uh, at the input, uh, then it is a true invariant because you're sort of accounting for all possible inputs. I guess what's the value of knowing that? So concretely, I in that example is changing because you have I++, but abstractly, it's within z between zero and 10. And that sounds like it has some value when it comes to analyzing it um, that I don't, that I can't quite connect. Right. So the, the way these, in, so there's a, a language of invariance, which, which defines your, how expressive your, your abs, there's, a, there's sort of a language of abstract values, which determines how expressive your invariants are. So in this case, uh, perhaps you have a statement, which is A of I equals, zero inside the loop right and now you know that the the length of your array is 10 and that coupled with the fact that i the value of i can always be is always between zero and nine right uh will tell you that your array access is, uh, never overflows uh and more generally you can have more expressive invariants that you know x is less than y or uh, x is not equal to zero that will be useful if you're trying to make sure that you're not dividing by zero uh, and so forth. So it's uh, whenever you're writing an assert in your program, you can come up with an appropriate abstract domain, which will help you prove that assert. Uh, and of course, people have come up with all sorts of interesting abstract domains, and not just numerical quantities like x less than y, but you can also have an abstraction which talks about, say, the heap, that this variable is pointed, uh, points to a linked list. Right, so you can define an abstract interpretation which shows that if you give me a linked list as an input and you have some C code which is say reversing a linked list, then what you get out is also a linked list, right, and so forth. So you can not just talk about the values, but you can also talk about the shape of the heap, 
This is sort of what shape analysis does. Uh, and, and those can be used for a whole, uh, verifying a whole bunch of other properties. So when you say you're improving the, the fixed point algorithm, that's not a small detail of the implementation. That's the, you're improving the core of, of exactly. what is driving the abstract interpretation. In this right, case. right. So there are roughly three components to an abstract interpreter. So one is designing the actual abstract domain. So there are certain operations you need, like join and meet and, and so on, uh, and representing those data structures, uh, representing abstract domains using clever data structures is, is extremely important. Um, the other part is this abstract semantics, which I sort of glossed over. Uh, that can be extremely tricky as well, because there you need this formal guarantee that what you're doing is an over approximation of the underlying concrete semantics. So for something like x equal to x plus one, eh, it's not too bad, right? But you can have pointers, you can have bitwise operators, uh, and so on. So in which case, you have to make sure that given this input abstract value, the output abstract value is in some sense sound. So people used to come up with sort of hand proofs uh, showing that it's sound. Uh, and in fact, during my uh, PhD dissertation, uh, me and my advisor, Tom Reps, we worked on some techniques for automating the construction of these abstract transformers. And the specific context there was actually machine code verification. So you're trying to have x86 code, uh, and you're trying to analyze or abstract, design an abstract interpreter for this low-level x86 code. So that's another component is designing these abstract transformers. And in practice, again, there's a trade-off. You can have precise abstract transformers, or you can have less precise ones, but they might be more efficient to execute. And then both of these components are, in some sense, fed into the fixed point engine, right? where you're computing this fixed point. And the order in which you visit nodes, uh, program nodes when you're computing the fixed point, uh, in, in our case, we are trying to do parallelism. Uh, that is all in the fixed point. So computationally, abstract interpretation boils down to this fixed point computation. And you mentioned something earlier that was that was kind of intriguing. Uh, you said something along the lines of if it goes too slow, they'll turn it off, which when we think about verification projects, like you mentioned a big verification project, they're thinking of like, we looked over the whole code, we saw that it was good, and then we wrote the paper and we shipped it. But obviously by saying we're going to turn it off, you're not just thinking of abstract interpretation as, as a one and done sort of sort of approach. Right. Can you tell me a little more about that? Right. So especially if you're trying to use uh, an abstract interpretation based tool, say in a compiler or any other sort of developer tool, you would expect that this would be run each time you build a code, right? Uh, so if, if your compiler takes 10 minutes to run uh, and say you, you, know, you use like dash O3 and it takes 10 minutes to run, you'll be like, mm, maybe I should just use dash O1. Right, uh, it's sort of something like that, right? Where you might want to do a more precise analysis, but it takes too long, uh, and you would rather just turn it off because uh, it, it it's not worth it. And maybe you might use it, you know, just before deployment, and, and or, or you know, might have some other trade offs. Um, and also, if you're trying to do this, you know, as part of your your review, uh, then you would want to run this incrementally, and there are. I think people have also started looking at that. It's how do you make some of these uh, ideas incremental? Uh, so the the Facebook Infer group has done some nice work on uh, designing compositional uh, static analysis tools for which would fit well into these sort of review uh, uh, tools as well. Since we're in this kind of teaching mode, um, we're already in the weeds, and, and some of these things you know, might land well with, with some of the listeners or watchers. Um, some of them aren't, but I have a, so I, I've been around, I've heard a little bit of infer and other analyzers um, like that. This idea of deterministic versus non-deterministic is something that I, that I don't quite grasp. You gave an example earlier about, you, know, you run an analyzer based on these techniques, then when you run it again, you might get slightly different results and you might not get the same bugs shown. To the untrained ear, that sounds really worrying. 
and and I, I get a lot of questions. I wonder what's your like general high level explanation of of why that is. What does that mean? And then what can be done about it? Because it sounds like you you worked on on that as well. Right. So th this issue of non determinism is specific to when you're trying to parallelize certain types of abstract interpretations. So uh, I think most tools are sequential. And, uh, and I think especially if you're trying to deploy some of these tools, I think uh, you make sure that it's deterministic, right? So uh, the, the reason that parallel abstract interpretation can become non-deterministic is uh, for a slightly technical reason, because you're, you have to do this thing called widening, which I'll get to. And then these widening operators are non-monotonic. Uh, and then when you have such operators, you can have non-determinism, right? Mm -hmm. So let me sort of un try to unwind some of that. So- Well, but before you do, just uh -huh. for my clarification, it doesn't mean that the results are wrong. It just means that sometimes you don't get some of them. Right, so they, they will still be sound, right? So uh, if, if you're, if your program analyzer is generating, say, an invariant, some that x is greater than zero, right? So it will it will be true that x is greater than zero. And if you run it again, maybe it might come back and say something like x is greater than ten, right? And x is greater than zero doesn't sort of invalidate the fact that x is greater than ten and, and so on. Uh, so uh, it will still be correct in that sense. But it'll definitely be annoying as a, as a user if, if that if, if that sort of answers your question. Yeah, I, I think it does to an extent, definitely. So in, in a lot of cases, there's more than one right answer, basically. Oh, definitely. Uh, to, to the question. Yes. Well, in every case, there's yes. more than one yes. right answer uh -huh. or every interesting case. Uh -huh. um, and so you just might get a different right answer. And, and the user experience sounds like it's way better if you always get the the same one, or at least if you have some control over what's going to come out. Right. So this particular uh, work, um, I mean, this was work done with my student, Sanko Kim, and a collaborator, Arno Bene, at Facebook. Uh, so that's been integrated into uh, this open source abstract interpreter uh, that Facebook has developed called Sparta. And, and Sparta is, is used in this Redex Android optimizer. So in, in that context, it was really important that the, the abstract interpreter, which formed a part of the static analysis tool chain, which is used in the optimizer, was deterministic because we would your your compiler as much as possible should be deterministic, right? And and in those use cases, you actually saw some really concrete speed ups based on the parallelization. Yes, definitely. So uh, in our, uh, you know, we at least got more than like I think it was more than two x speed up when you had four threads, uh, and this was you know using quite a number of open source benchmarks uh, that we had. So this was not sort of academic uh, uh, benchmarks, but like open source code that we analyzed. Uh, so I think we at least got 2x speed up when we were using four threads. Uh, but depending on the application, you would get up to 10x speed up. Uh, and again, it, it, it was nice to have that theoretical result because uh, we, we had some confidence that in some ways, we were optimal theoretically. So uh, it, it wasn't that we were just unlucky or our algorithm wasn't quite good enough. Uh, when we didn't get speed up, we would go look at the program and you would say, oh, yes, there is actually not a lot of parallelism that the abstract interpreter can exploit when it's analyzing this code. So essentially, this work basically was, a, was getting that same determinism yes. by using a parallel kind of computation of all these things, the right. same as you would when it was sequential? Right. So in, in, in fact, we had a theorem which said that the answer, so there was an existing sequential algorithm. And what we showed is we, we sort of parallelized it. The parallelism was optimal. Uh, and the result was the same as the sequential one. So in, in practice, that was also important because in some sense, it was uh, backward compatible. So the you know whenever you switch out the sequential with the parallel code, not only is it deterministic, but it's the same as the sequential one which you're used to yesterday. Uh, so I think that that was quite nice. I mean, it, it was nice from an academic theoretical point of view, but uh, 
you know the these open source tools uh, were using the sequential algorithm and we were able to just replace it um, and uh, so it it was it been it's in the sparta tool from facebook and it's also been integrated into uh, an open source abstract interpreter from nasa which is called icos uh, so that that was also kind of nice to have and their use case is more on verification uh, rather than op code optimization well that's i mean to me at least that sounds like an ideal outcome of of you know what would be academic research is that it gets almost immediately applied to real things in the real world and shows real mm -hmm. results. Yeah, that yeah, it was very exciting. Uh, I think uh, the the way the project started off was actually by me not understanding the the particular sequential algorithm, uh, which I had sort of heard about in my PhD, and I was like, okay, I kind of understand it. Um, yeah, I look at the paper; it makes sense. I can work it out, but. You don't true. I never truly grokked it. Uh, and I, I was talking to Arno, and he said something similar. He's like, "Yes, yes, I understand it, but I don't think I completely understand it." Uh, and it it sort of reminded me of another algorithm, which I read many years ago uh, in the compiler literature. Uh, and then just trying to understand the sequential algorithm, uh, what we realized that. It didn't need to be sequential. It could be parallel, um, and and then sort of we build off of that. So the original motivation was not actually to build a parallel deterministic abstract interpreter. The original motivation was just like uh, I don't quite understand what you know. It's a very commonly used uh, algorithm uh, by Bordonk, uh, in the, it developed in the 90s, and all major abstract interpreters use it in some way. So Infer has it, uh, you know, Sparta, ICOS, and so on. Uh, so it was sort of started off as an academic curiosity, uh, but then slowly it was like, oh, the sequential algorithm in some ways is computing a total order over the program points. So it's sequential, right? It, everything is ordered. And that need not be the case. You can actually have a partial order. And once you have a partial order, you can sort of parallelize things. Uh, and and uh, that's how it sort of came about. Um, and and uh, I'm quite happy with with the fact that we were able to uh, you know push it to uh, to both the Facebook and the, the NASA tool. Uh, and the the popul paper that definitely doesn't hurt either. Yeah. Oh, I can believe that. That's great results. It's also a really nice story for people who are wondering how you go do research. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a lot of, when you watch successful researchers, a lot of times it feels like, well, they just had this great idea and then they, they knew what they needed to do and then they went and did it. And when reality, in reality, when you talk to people that have had success, a lot of times it was like, well, we kind of started poking at this thing. And then before we knew it, the natural result was that we kept diving deeper and deeper. And all of a sudden we found this cool application. Very few people say, here's my huge problem. Uh -huh. I'm going to like eat it all in one go and we're going to be a, we're, we're going to get a popple paper. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and that's the, I think that's the most exciting part about research is that you don't know where you're exactly going to land up on. Um, I mean, as an advisor, I try to make sure that my students see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's just that the light might change uh, as you are doing your research. Uh, I think uh, they, they feel a lot more confident knowing that it will eventually go somewhere. Uh, but of course, every week or every month, it might change a little bit about where we're trying to go. Uh, and I think the collaboration with Arno at Facebook has been really excellent. Uh, and you know, trying and, and the fact that we were able to push it to their open source tool was also quite nice. Yeah. So having that collaboration um, is, is definitely very helpful. So this is, I think we've covered, from what I understand, about half of the work that you're doing so far is, is around Im improving scalability. And then there's another chunk of your work that's centered around different applications and new and unique applications for, for the techniques that you've been working on. Can you tell us a bit about what you've been right. doing? There? So um, the way I view it is if you, if you want static analysis to be applicable, uh, to, to real developers, there are a couple of problems. Uh, so one is scalability. 
So being able to get the results you want soon-ish, uh, and and de and depending on the use case, soon-ish might mean a, a, a few seconds or a few minutes or or even a few hours. Uh, uh, that's one problem. Uh, in some ways, you know, I, I worked on some of these techniques to get more precise analysis, you know, by talking about these abstract transformers and so on. And people have developed some very nice abstractions. So you can uh, reason very deeply about programs. So uh, I felt you know, focusing on scalability would be more helpful in that case. The other problem is this whole problem of, of false positives. So you, you run your static analysis tools, you want to find bugs, and then it spits out like a thousand reports and maybe one of them is right i'm, I'm exaggerating a bit but uh, you know uh, high false positive rates are a well known problem in static analysis and uh, there are a couple of problems with this one is i feel you can't turn on certain precise analysis because of scalability so it sort of ties back to what we were talking about earlier and then the other problem is being able to have a, a a reasonably precise model of the environment. So all software works in the context of like you know it, it calls libraries, it it calls operating system calls. So it's not a, a it's not a closed system. It's it's always interacting with the the outside world. And what the outside world again depends on where you where you decide to have that boundary. Uh, so so a lot of the false positives are because you're not modeling the pre and post conditions of these external functions that you're calling, right? So, uh, so and this is a sort of, again, a, a well-known problem that certain people are looking at. Uh, a lot of academic research sort of hand waves around that. Uh, people uh, have this notion of uh, soundiness or soundness with some assumptions and and making sure that you're making these assumptions explicit and so forth. Uh, but you know, in, in my experience, uh, this, coming up with these, these external uh, models is quite important and time consuming. Uh, so while I was at Microsoft Research, this was before my PhD, we were working on this static driver verifier. Uh, so this was meant to take uh, C driver code and make sure it, it satisfies certain properties so you don't see the blue screen of death in Windows. And there, the external world was the operating system. And uh, if you don't have the right model the, of those what those functions are doing, you can get a whole bunch of false positives. And interestingly, it, it also depends on the particular static analysis you're doing, what sort of model you should have. Uh, so I think based on that, we've been doing some work uh, related to this error handling uh, that I mentioned earlier. So you can think of this error handling specification as, as sort of trying to model the outside world, right? And uh, we've been looking at techniques which will combine sort of traditional static analysis with sort of machine learning approaches, where you're trying to uh, import notions of, of uh, embeddings, which you see in natural language processing. So you have this notion of word embeddings, Right, uh, where king and queen are close together in in an embedding uh, space, uh, and it's sort of far away from an orange, which is a different semantic notion. So you're trying to use something like that, but talk about functions. So map program functions into uh, an embedding space and come up and import machine learning algorithms to actually compute these embeddings uh, so that they have some semantic meaning. And then use and and the intuition is that if if your embedding if in your embedding your functions are close together, then they might be semantically uh, similar as well, and and then you can sort of say that they behave in the same way. So we we've, we've been using this to uh, essentially expand our error specifications. So you know the specification of of one function, and then you have a bunch of other functions that are close to it in your embedding. And then the hypothesis was that, well, maybe they also behave the same way. Uh, and, it, and it, at least our early results seem to indicate that that is the case. So that's sort of trying to supercharge our static analysis uh, tools using some machine learning uh, technology. And you kind of casually talked about this project with Microsoft and you know mentioned that it might not 
result in as many blue screens. If it's the project I'm thinking of talking about that casually is kind of the, uh, my understanding is that project had a huge impact, right? Is that the, is this, is this the same project I'm thinking about? So that was a fairly long running project. So I, I so I, I think it started in the early 2000s, uh, uh, you know, Tom Ball, Sri Ram Rajamani uh, started this whole static driver verify along with others. Uh, and over the years, they've sort of improved on their, their verification engines. Uh, and while I was at Microsoft Research India, they had a new way of doing things. And I was sort of, uh, sort of charged with, um, you know, they had some academic results and I was sort of charged with integrating it with the, the core sort of tool and, and focusing on scalability there. And, and again, that, that sort of also uh, helped me develop this uh, appreciation for scalability where, you know, in, on, the, on the first day when we sort of ran it, it, it timed out after four or five hours. And then I think I was there for about a year. And I think on the last day, the same, uh, for the same benchmark, I think it terminated in like 0.1 seconds, right? So over the course of roughly a year, we had a lot of sort of engineering ways of scaling things up, as well as uh, new research techniques that that resulted in, in better scalability. Uh, and I think and this was a while back, and I'm sure there've been a lot more work uh, uh, done for that that project. Yeah. So you've also done work in uh, neural nets. We we have seen some of your papers there. Can you tell us a little about what that's about right uh, so as we know i mean uh, deep neural networks have have been very successful at, at a whole range of problems uh, you know image recognition natural language processing and they're increasingly being used in safety critical software so autonomous vehicles uh, medical analysis healthcare so on so uh, i think it it seemed like a natural move to try and see while well, the nature of software is changing so should the nature of, of program analysis Right for such software. Uh, so more recently, we've been looking at the the following problem, uh, which is you're given a deep neural network. So let's say it's it's uh, an image recognition network. Um, you've trained it. You spend uh, a week training it, hundreds of GPU hours. You deploy it, um, and now someone comes and says, "Hey, here is an image. It should be classified as a cat, but you're saying it's an orange." Uh, and you're like, okay, now what? So the, the question is, you, you have a deep neural network, you found bug in the deep neural network, and the, the, the task is, what do you do? Right? So in, in as software engineers, we're, we're quite used to this workflow of, of writing code, making sure it's correct as much as we can, deploying it, getting a bug report, uh, thinking really hard, writing a few lines of code to patch the code, uh, getting rid of that bug, making sure that that bug is gone, updating your test cases and so forth, and then deploying it. And as much as possible, we try to make sure that our, our code is monotonically increasing. It's not always the case, uh, but at least there are lots of processes in place to make sure that, that it does occur in practice. Right? You have regression tests, unit tests, and so forth. Uh, monotonically increasing meaning it, it's always getting better it's always right? yes it, yes it, by some metric yeah yeah it's always getting better in some metric yes um and uh the sort of high level goal is well deep neural networks are part of our software engineering stack now uh and if you get a, a bug report what do you do so currently what you could do is add this to your training set and retrain it and hope for the best. So there are a couple of problems with this. One is you may not actually fix this bug, right? You might you might still just be unlucky and maybe then you have to go and tune some hyperparameters and pray. Uh, you might get worse in other ways, right? So you might fix this particular bug, but then another uh, unforeseen uh, issue comes up. And of course, it's also time consuming where you have to go and retrain it uh, all over again. Uh, so what we are, what we've been doing is trying to come up with these, what we call provable patching of deep neural networks, where you're given a pre-trained network, you're given some specification. Let's say you're given, here are 10 images and you want them to be classified in a particular way. Can you go and patch the network? Can you surgically go and change the weights and parameters of the deep neural network 
so that you're guaranteed that these 10 images are classified correctly. But that's not quite enough. What we also guarantee is that the changes to the weights are as small as possible. So they're minimal changes. And the reason we want that is you want the patch to be local in some sense, right? You don't want to destroy the way, uh, the, destroy how the, or change, completely change how the neural network behaves for other unrelated images, right? So that's sort of what we've been working on. And we've had uh, some pretty impressive preliminary results there where we've taken image net networks, We've taken uh, you know, 800 images which were classified incorrectly uh, and then been able to modify uh, the network so that you uh, th these 800 are correctly uh, uh, classified and the accuracy on, on the usual validation set does not decrease. So it still behaves well on the set of images that it, that it performed well on before, except it's also doing well on these new 800 images. So that's sort of what we're looking at uh, right now. That sounds amazing. How did this work come to be? So this is work which I've been doing with, with my student, Matthew Sotterday. Um, so the project started off, I guess, a couple of years ago in a different direction. Uh, it started off by trying to basically do abstract interpretation of, of deep neural networks. Right. So I, I had one hammer, and I saw a different nail, and I was like, let's see what happens. Uh, it turned out that didn't go quite well. Uh, uh, these neural networks have these huge dimensions. Uh, uh, things don't quite scale and work as well as we hoped. Uh, and also other people started sort of doing similar things in that space, and it didn't seem as fresh. And uh, I think at one point, we were, we were a little bit uh, sort of stuck. Uh, and uh, we said, well, we, you know, ideally, we would want to take some fairly high dimensional polytope and push it through a neural network. That's what abstract interpretation would do, right? You have some abstract value and you want to push it through your network and get the resulting abstract value. And, and that's sort of useful when you're trying to do analysis. And uh, that didn't quite work. So then we said, can we push a line through, right? Just a line in a high dimensional space. Can we push that through the network and figure out what the corresponding line is at the output, right? So the line basically represents an infinite set of inputs. Uh, and uh, that, it turned out, uh, we could do, and it could scale up quite well. Uh, and this, and we had some nice applications of this primitive, uh, and we, we published this in uh, uh, NeurIPS earlier this year. Um, and uh, what that led to was this, this general insight, which is if you can sort of symbolically capture uh, a system, then you can synthesize it, right? So it's it's sort of what what a lot of the program synthesis approach do is that if you can if you can verify something, then you can synthesize it, right? That was sort of a high level hand wavy thing uh, that we wanted to do, because what we could do is for, at least for this line, we could sort of exactly capture how the network behaved in some ways. Uh, but that didn't seem quite, uh, we, we weren't quite there yet. Um, and, uh, but it, it sort of got us thinking about this problem of, of synthesizing networks or fixing them and, and so forth. Uh, but the, the other insight which enables a lot of this work is what we call decoupled deep neural networks. So if you think about, uh, an operator, so a, a ReLU operator in a deep neural network. So all it does is if the input value is less than zero, it's going to output zero. If the input output is uh, greater than zero, it's going to just copy that input to the output, right? So that's how uh, this rectified linear unit ReLU uh, operator works. So if you look deeply into what a ReLU is doing, it's doing two things. It's controlling whether or not that node is active, right? Whether it has an output or not. And it's also controlling what the output is, right? So, so it's doing this activation and it's doing the value. And uh, the, the sort of uh, insight we had is what if you separate those out? Or what if you decouple activation from the value? 
So in some sense, a decoupled neural network, you can think of it as you have your original DNN and you're sort of duplicating it. And then you have these uh, sort of stamp edges, which are uh, uh, where the, you know, the top uh, uh, network is, is controlling the activation of the bottom network. And the bottom network, all it does is compute the value, right? So decoupling this turns out to be the key in, in being able to sort of symbolically manipulate these neural networks in the way we want. So you, when you decouple them, you keep the activation as is and changing the value, right? And controlling uh, the output by just changing the value turns out to be reducible to a, a linear program. So, because the 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 sort of the fact that a ReLU network or or all of these nonlinear operators are doing these two, uh, they they're playing these two roles, it turns out to be why it's sort of tricky. Uh, to because anytime you move anything, you're not only changing the value that is outputted, but you're also changing whether or not that node is activated or not. Right. And and if you think about what a uh, at least what a ReLU deep neural network is doing is that it's sort of partitioning your your space, and that partitioning depends on which nodes are active and which nodes are not active. And in each of these partitions, you actually have an affine function, right? Because once once you uh, once you've decided whether a node is active or not, it's just uh, it's either zero or it's you know, y equal to x. So within each of these partitions, it's affine. And uh, the interesting part is that you have a bunch of these partitions. Uh, and the, the main insight was if you fix the partitions, then you can manipulate the value, the, fun the, the particular affine function in this partition. And that turns out to be easy to do. So it, it, it sort of like started off as, again, trying to do some analysis, getting frustrated and saying, can you at least do a line? And then understanding that ReLU is sort of doing these two things um, and then sort of uh, uh, coming up with this problem, this notion of decoupling. And then uh, Matthew had this very nice generalization where you can go beyond ReLU networks. You can deal with other nonlinear operators like sigmoid and tanh and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, the example I gave was about images of a finite set of images that you wanted to classify. But we also handled something like, hey, here is a line, right? Uh, and this line should be classified in a particular way. And the reason this is useful is uh, you, can, you can have images that are, say, corrupted by fog. So there's this data set called MNIST. Uh, MNIST C for corruption. And they're basically MNIST images, but they're corrupted by fog and so forth, right? So you could say, hey, I want to patch my network so that it's, it correctly classifies these corrupted images. But you might also want to say the images along the line from the uncorrupted to the corrupted also should be classified as three or whatever it is. And, that, and, the, and those interpolated images you can think of as, as uh, images with different levels of fog. So you're sort of guaranteeing that any image along the line is classified correctly, right? And this sort of comes back to what our Europe's paper was trying to do, which was sort of trying to get this exact characterization of a neural network along uh, these low dimensional polytopes like lines and planes and so forth. Uh, so it sort of cycled back to that work we were doing. So this all sounds like a complete departure from what you're doing in, in the rest of your in the rest of your work do you feel like it, it, it is that or do you think that there's a, a purpose that brings these things together so um, in general you sort of let the problem guide you so I I, I don't believe in siloing myself in in a particular subfield um, so it, it, as I said it, it started off as saying hey let's do abstract interpretation. Of, of deep neural networks and so forth, but uh, over time, it you just follow you follow the problem, you follow the solution, and see where it takes you. Um, and also, it, it's not just me working on this. So uh, my students, they also obviously have a huge influence on where the problem 
and the solution goes. Uh, so it, it's sort of like that sort of collaboration where you're like, hey, what if we could, or what if we can, uh, you know, would this be possible uh, and so forth. And, and we just sort of let it flow that way. And, uh, you know, this is something which um, I can credit my advisors who have always encouraged me to sort of just follow follow the problem, follow the solution and see where it goes. Uh, so, you know, my, my PhD advisor, Tom Reps, he was, he, he had very broad interests. Uh, I remember in my first couple of years of my PhD, I was working on just on machine code verification, like model checking. And towards the end, you know, we had results which were talking about you know, parallel SAT solvers and this connection between uh, uh, abstract interpretation and SMP solvers, and we were working on separation logic and and uh, and so forth. So, and and uh, if you had told me on my first day of my PhD that you would be working on this, I would be like, no, I, I, that's not that's not what my advisor is asking me to do, do right now. That's not what I've I've done previously. Uh, but that's sort of uh, something which I've learned from my advisors and even my master's advisor. Uh, you know, Professor Govindarajan, he was also very encouraging, saying, you know, just just try and follow the problem. Like, don't don't restrict yourself in any way um, and make sure you're making progress and you know, something interesting will come up and something useful will come up as well. And it sounds like in passing this on to your students, you've been able to empower them to sort of help control the direction of these projects. So they've really been a valuable part of finding these new directions and finding these exciting applications, even though maybe somebody that showed up expecting to be doing abstract interpretation is now publishing in right. uh, in machine learning absolutely. conferences. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something which I, I make explicit to them, saying that, hey, I'm interested in some of these ideas. I'm probably better at solving problems in a few areas, but that doesn't mean we will be stuck in, in, in those problems or those solutions. Right, so even uh, this this problem where we're trying to find these embeddings of functions, uh, that was a collaboration with uh, Professor Cindy Rubio at UC Davis, who was working on these sort of error handling bugs and so forth. Uh, and then we sort of looked at this problem, and I had this you know hint of an idea about how to use uh, word to vec for functions, but I didn't quite have an application in mind. Um, and then we sort of landed uh, landed up collaborating on on this problem with uh, with with a student whom we co-advised, uh, uh, Daniel DeFries, and 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 sort of that that also was fairly natural in that sense. So uh, it's usually not the case where you have a, a set problem and a solution in mind and you stick with it for for years to come. Uh, if you're lucky, that can happen, but uh, you might, or, or rather, you might start off with that mindset. It's always nice to have something concrete in mind, uh, some concrete insight that you can build off of. But then you just, you know, go with the flow and see where it takes you. Yeah, it's wonderful that you encourage them up front because it, if you didn't, they might otherwise not feel as free to mention some of the some of the ideas that that come to them. So I'm sure that I'm sure that in being really upfront about that. You set that expectation. They say, "Oh, I had a, I had an idea, and it sounds kind of crazy, but now I, now I know I can bring that to my advisor, and they, they won't tell me I'm, they won't tell me I'm crazy, or they won't tell me that's, that's not what we do in this group." Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it also prepares them for the kind of crazy things I tell them in our in our meetings. <laughs> uh, if people wanna either kind of read more about either of the or, or any of the projects that you talked about and the work that you talked about or play with some of that that's that's kind of further along what can they do where can they find that so uh i have uh my uc davis website has all the publications uh and we is also linked to my research group website where you you have links to the source code uh and uh, they, of course they can always email me uh, and uh, i'll be happy to connect with them and, and so forth. So the, the website is uh, takur.cs.ucdavis.edu. Yeah, we'll put that link in the, in the notes. We're, yeah. we're nearing the end. Yeah, is there anything else you'd like to, to add before we close out? So I guess one thing is, uh, it sort of connects with, with the question you had, which is, I think 
definitely you want to encourage people you know in the industry or people who uh, want to explore formal methods to to reach out to me and, and other researchers uh, I think there's there's probably a lot more collaboration that could happen in terms of uh, usability scalability specific problems that uh, we could work on um, I I understand you know from as an academic, there are different uh, metrics and different goals and different constraints, uh, and and those obviously differ from uh, those if you're if you're working in a company or you're working towards a problem. But I think there's enough common ground uh, where something can can uh, can occur, and there are you know I think there are lots of researchers out there who are uh, more than willing to to collaborate and work uh, in in some capacity with with folks outside of academia. Uh, so I would sort of encourage them to reach out in some ways, try out tools, um, uh, you know, file issues, send out pull requests and so forth. Yeah. I love that you said that. I, it's one of the like faculty, I, I think in some people's mind, it's like this, like, oh, it's this busy professor. They're doing research. They don't want to hear, they don't want to hear from me. They don't want my, this, this person's so deep into abstract interpretation and program analysis. There's no way my question is going to be like smart enough for them, but everybody dreams of the day that they get this email from uh, a student, even like an undergrad or a, or somebody working in industry that's just like, hey, I have heard about abstract interpretation and I just want to learn more. What can I do? Can right. you help me? And, and the vast majority of people are faculty because they want to teach or they want to be involved and, and spread the word in some sense. And so that sort of thing is just so welcome and so exciting when it comes. Yeah. So I think encouraging people to do that is wonderful. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I really enjoyed that conversation. Thank you so much for, for joining us and, and, and kind of sharing with us what you're doing. Yeah, and, and hopefully some of that was useful. I, I know <laughs> I, I can tend to ramble on a bit or maybe get distracted by certain things and whatever, but hopefully that was informative enough. I, it's I a get, sign that you love what you're doing. <laughs> that that's right, and you're you're a good storyteller for sure. So so, you know, the the, the end result people won't know what got cut out, but but uh, but I'm sure it will make sense. Um, but yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks so yeah, much for joining. Same here. Us.